All right, so today I got a good friend of mine, entrepreneur, former light heavyweight UFC fighter, Mr. Matt Van Buren. How's it going, dog? Good to see you, Roger Chan. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anytime, buddy. Yeah, man. Happy so, to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you're here. Finally, we're finally doing this, man. Yeah. Been talking about it for a while. But anyways, uh, awesome. if you want, uh, I guess kind of tell everyone where you're from, where you grew up, a little bit about like your childhood. and. Um, so I, I grew up in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia, Southeast Virginia, born and raised. Um, I wouldn't really call it, uh, it's not city. It's definitely not big city, but it's not really like country either. You know, it's kind of like suburbs. So <clears throat> um, I grew up in a Christian household, both, both parents in the house. I had two brothers. I was a middle child. Um, yeah, me and my brothers were, were knuckleheads as kids and, <laughs> and got in trouble. And, uh, um, How many brothers? I got two brothers. Two brothers. So where do two. you fall within that order? Uh, I'm the middle. Okay. So I have an older brother, a younger brother. Did you did y'all fight a lot when y'all were kids? Can you adjust this um, <clears throat> Yeah, 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 we did. Um my older brother used to whip me a lot, and then one day I whooped him, and then he never got me after that. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. But, yeah, my little my little brother, he was so much younger than us um, at the time, you know, so it was like. So you get along with thing. him pretty well right now. Yeah, 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 I get along with him good now. We didn't, we didn't get as long. There was a big age gap when we were younger, you know, so, like, what you're doing at. When I was 17, I think he was uh, – maybe 12 or something you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it was a big age gap when we were growing up but you know as we got older we we got closer and had more stuff in common cool you know it's weird because like <clears throat> i've known you for a little bit now right like yeah for several years now and like i've never really asked you this because i don't know why it's not because like <clears throat> i didn't i guess i didn't really think of it but like I, I've known you. Like you, I, I know you were a fighter, like mm -hmm. in the UFC. But then, like I never knew, like how exactly did you get into that? Were you always fighting as a kid, or like, like did you just think, oh, I think I can make some money fighting, or I want to like fight the champ? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. So actually, I didn't. Uh, it's kind of a crazy story, really. Um, like, I wasn't an athlete in school at all. I smoked weed all the time, <laughs> like heavy amounts of weed, okay. like more than I care to admit. Um, and it, it's just a shame because I would have been such a better, like looking what I achieved in a short amount of time, like imagine how far I would have gone if I would have been an athlete or whatever, you know? But I got hit by a car when I was 12 and broke my leg like really bad. Um, and I had, and it probably took two years before I made a full recovery from that. You know, I was in a wheelchair for six months, and then I had a hard cast, like from my from my foot all the way up to my groin. I had a full leg cast, and I wore that for like a year. So it was like a year and a half from the wheelchair to the to the leg cast, and then after that. Uh, you know, so it was like two years from the time it came off where I was rehab, like a walk in at least. So at that time I was 14. So that kind of messed up my sports too as a kid. Um, <clears throat> and then when I was 14, like I hung out with a lot of older kids in my neighborhood. Like I said, older, but they were like 16. But when you're 14 and like kids are 16, it's a big, it's a big difference back then. You know what I mean? Um, so they were smoking weed. I started smoking weed and you know we were just getting in trouble i actually joined the wrestling team in 11th grade if you don't know this uh because i'm a pretty good wrestler now but i actually joined the wrestling team in 11th grade i had two matches all year and i got pinned in both matches in like 30 seconds or like less than 30 seconds like it was embarrassing like i think i quit the team but uh we we used to we used to like street fight and stuff as kids um we'd have like boxing matches like backyard boxing matches at the parks and stuff and i always did pretty well um 
so we always like almost every weekend somebody would have a party and there would be like a fight so we did get in like street fights quite frequently um i always liked to fight and then i had a buddy so i had a buddy who around the time i started training to fight i was about 20 years old and a lot of guys that i was hanging out with were getting in the wrong shit you know what i mean fucking going to jail getting in trouble getting addicted to hard drugs and i'm like i gotta find something constructive to do with my life you know what i mean and i was going to community college but i hated school i was terrible at school too like even to this day it's hard for me to st- it's it's crazy because i'm like such a like like it's physical stuff is so easy for me right like you like go do these workouts or whatever like i'll kill it. it's nothing but for, for me to like sit down and like read a book or study stuff on the computer or like try to learn stuff it's so hard for me i just don't i don't know it's, it's i've always been that way i just don't have the attention span for it uh and that's some things i struggle with mainly as an entrepreneur you know it's like uh, it's like if it's physical work it's so easy for me to do it so i feel like i should have been a roofer or something but it's but you still there's still stuff you have to learn you know what i mean and it's always been hard for me but physical stuff is always easy and uh <clears throat> so I had a buddy in Virginia Beach who it did some kickboxing fights, like Muay Thai kickboxing. And um, he had some fights. And I was like, dude, you know what? I was like, I want to start training. I want to take some fights because trying, trying to stay out of trouble, have some fun. You know, I was like, I don't, I don't mind fun. I was like, I want to do some MMA fights. Cause we used to always watch UFC. You know what I mean? And I was like, I'm down to do some MMA fights. And so I just started training like every day. And – I started I started falling in love with it and took a couple fights and I won and it was like beating dudes up and I was like man this is way better than a real job I was like I'm just gonna be a professional fighter and make millions of dollars that's what I thought at the time and uh, the more fights I took the more fights I won and the more disciplined I got with my diet and training and everything and then you know from the time I was 21 years old until I pretty much retired at 31 my entire life and every decision I made was based on me being a better athlete and a better martial artist and all I did was compete and I ate slept and breathed it uh, breathed it for 10 years you know yeah so so you know how like like in the sport they have you got like your striker, you got your strikers, and you got your grapplers. Did you like identify with one side or the other, or were you kind of like more of a mixture of both? What did you consider yourself? Yeah, I was definitely more of a striker, um, just being tall. But I also didn't have that wrestling base. You know what I mean? So I didn't have the wrestling background that a lot of guys that had that were wrestlers or college wrestlers. So I couldn't. I couldn't really be a strike. I couldn't really be a grappler or wrestler when I just was 10, 12 years behind a lot of these guys, you know, some of these guys have been wrestling since they were five years old and now we're grown men at 21, 22. So you know how to bang though, but I know how to bang (laughs) and I always, you know what I mean? I was tall and long and I always, you know, and I I knew how to bang and I'd always throw and I knew how to throw. Yeah. So obviously I started learning wrestling at first for defense because nobody wanted to bang with me. You know what I mean? They just all wanted to get hit and they want to take me down. So I had to work heavy on my defensive wrestling. Uh, I hired a guy, my first real wrestling coach was a guy named John Cerritos. He's like, I think he wrestled in college. Uh, I can't remember what his background at this point. Um, But I think he was an NCAA wrestler, wrestled in college, and he was a college wrestling coach. Local at Old Dominion University. I think he was coaching there. It was our college back in Virginia. And I hired him like 50 bucks, uh, 50 bucks a private. Like, and I would buy private lessons with him as much as I could afford, you know. And I would just have him come in like a couple times a week and just teach me how to wrestle defense, you know, defensively. And he really helped progress my wrestling ability pretty quickly. Uh, getting to work with him on a one on one basis and just. So you knew from you know, like an earlier age that you were already investing in yourself as kind of like that stepping stone to like further propel yourself for the future right so i guess whenever you got out of the fighting 
like did you go straight into entrepreneurship or, or what led you to that like how did you know that you wanted to do what you're doing today or was it another just kind of by chance thing what led you towards the entrepreneurship route uh necessity really i mean i didn't have a choice but i mean they yeah. have a lot of nine to five jobs out there right like you yeah but what am that. i but at, you know at 32 years old <laughs> when you have no real work history right. okay and you have no real skills like who's gonna hire you paying you any kind of money what are you gonna get a job doing you know mm -hmm. i was teaching fitness and martial arts but you know unless you have a social media presence you're not really making any money teaching fitness and martial arts unless you know you have to learn the social media side which i never i i completely neglected when i was fighting which is a huge mistake obviously now knowing what i know now but um because i i mean i could have built probably a, i would probably have a massive social media right now if i went hard on it from the like when i started and documented everything and then getting on the ultimate fighter and all but i was just very like rarely posted on social media the whole time. I just wasn't into it. But um, yeah, I mean, it was really just necessity because there's there's no options. You know what I mean? And, and I never dealt well with bosses because, you know, uh, I, I, part of me, I guess it's the fighter in me or the you know, stuff. Or you, yeah. stuff but, you know, you always, every time you have a boss too, they're always a fucking asshole. <laughs> and, they, and they act like they're better than you because they're your boss and like trying to talk down to you. And that's very hard to, it it, that's hard to yeah. deal with for anybody, but it's especially hard for a six foot five former UFC fighter who had a 10 year of just like trying to be the fucking man you know what i'm saying yeah. like trying to like you're talking about you know living like the elite alpha male life trying to be a fighter and then it's like you're trying to go to a workplace where this little fat dork who's like thinks he's above you because your boss like trying to talk down to you is like bro i'll slap the shit out of you <laughs> like, right you know yeah. so i it just that is one side of it but the other side of it was it just Nobody was going to pay me any real money because I didn't have any skills, rightfully so. It's like, I'm what did you do way. for the last 10 years? You yeah. know, it's like I fought people in a cage. And like, okay, well, we'll pay you 15 bucks an hour. Right, right. <laughs> like you start at the bottom. Yeah. You know, it's like so. There, Yeah, there was new. I knew. So <clears throat> when I first started getting out of fighting, I found like Grant Cardone. He was one of the first big guys I found on social media. And I started following him and a lot of his stuff really resonated with me. And, you know, he was just talking about people, people always talk about doing what they love, right? Like you have to do what you love for a living. You'll never work a day in your life, right? Like you hear people say that, but we both know we're grown men, right? You have a family to support. I don't have a family, but we have fucking bills, right? <laughs> we live in America. We're in a, uh, we're, we live on a financial planet, right? You need money. You have to have money, especially if you have kids. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing that I never really thought of that perspective before until I heard Grant say, he's like, you don't need a fucking job you love. You need a job that's going to pay you some damn money. And that's where I was at in my life. I was like, dude, I don't, as long as it's legal, I was like, I don't care what I do. I just need to make some money. I'm just not going to break the law or like whore myself out. You know what I yeah. mean? And so as long as it's ethical and legal, I'm going to do it. And I knew I had to get in sales because I knew I was going to, I wasn't going to make any money doing anything other than high commission sales. And Grant was a high commission sales guy and I followed him and he always talked about sales. And I was like, yeah, I'm trying to be like these guys making 200, 300 grand a year. You know, I was like, I don't want to make 50 grand a year, 80 grand a year. I'm like, that sounds terrible. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, you know what I mean? Money gives you options. And For sure. Yeah. People that say money doesn't buy happiness are so full of shit. We both know that. I mean, <laughs> anybody says that they just quit. They just they say that because they quit trying to make money and they gave up. Yep. Uh, because I can tell you, I've made fifty grand a year, and I've made far more than fifty grand a year. And I will choose the year of making far more than fifty grand a year every year than the year where I made fifty. Yeah. You know. For sure. Yeah. I'm, I remember that, like <laughs> I I was kind of in the same boat too. Like when I was. I remember my first <clears throat> sales job that I had, and this was, I was selling cell phones at, a, at the kiosk in the mall. And I remember my ch paycheck for the week, like it was like $1,200. I was like 17 years old at that time, yes. like $1,200 for one week's work. 
For a 17 year old, $1,200, that's a lot of money. That's like more than what my any of my parents were making in one week. Dude, I would have been pumped to make that at 25 years old, right? being a broke fighter. No, so that like kind of opened my eyes. I was like, okay, the sales thing, I don't have to like tr exactly trade my units of time for a specific dollar amount. It's just how much I sell, right? Right. So that kind of opened my eyes to sales and the whole entrepreneurship. And I was, I've just been involved in sales uh, ever since and uh, as an entrepreneur ever since that. But, you know, coming from, I guess, from your background, what would you like? Were there any skills that you saw overlapped or wh what were some of the bigger challenges coming from fighting into the world of entrepreneurship, would you say, from your from your point of view? <clears throat> For me, it was a lot of personal development. You know, you have to understand, like, people that have never lived a life don't understand. And so I'm, while I've never been to prison or jail, I would kind of equate it into, like, a similar thing. You know, like, when you go from literally l eat, sleeping, and breathing mixed martial arts, and that's all you know and that's all you do. I mean, there was years in my life where I didn't hang out with anybody that wasn't a fighter. And fighters are a different breed of people, right? You got to be... You're, you're, you're a unique individual to consistently train to go out there and get smashed by some badass dude for like little to no money and just live poor. Like we literally were poor. Like I lived in, I literally, when I say I lived in the gym, I literally lived in the gym, like upstairs in a dorm room with six other fighters, prison style. There was three beds on this wall and there was three beds on this wall. It was literally one room with six beds in it. And we had like a, <laughs> we had a Bunsen burner at the gym in California and a grill outside. But we would like, dude, I had literally, I had one plate, one spoon, one fork and one knife for like a year and a half. And I used it for every meal and I would just wash it in the mop bucket sink yes. at the gym every day. I did that for a year and yep. a half. I had one plate, one fork, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I just would drink water out of a gallon jug every day. Yeah. And that's like sometimes... Like you and I know, you just got to pound sand for a while until you actually get any type of result back, right? So like that makes sense whenever like we can talk about that because like we like as entrepreneurs, you, you kind of know that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, you, have your, you have your one, as you mentioned, you have that one aspect where it's the mental, the mental part, right? And then you have the second aspect where you, you're, you're able to more put your body through the tough physical work. But then when it comes to the mental side of things, it's a complete different ball game, right? right. So, uh, you know, if you're if I guess if you take the average Joe out on the street, what is it do you think that separates someone like you who can actually deal with the mental side and the physical physical side to pursue entrepreneurship than the average Joe? How come the average like how come most <clears throat> of society can't do it? What, what do you think that that is that? differentiates like the entrepreneurial mindset with the average Joe. Most people as a whole are mentally weak. Okay. And mental toughness is like physical toughness and like getting in shape, right? You can, you can become more mentally tough. You know what I mean? Andy Frazella, who's a, a famous entrepreneur, anybody who follows knows him. I mean, he's written a book on mental toughness. He talks about it all the time if you listen to his podcast. All these successful guys talk about it. That's why he created the 75 Hard program. You know what I mean? The Live Hard program. People think 75 Hard is a physical fitness program. It's not a, it's not a fitness program. It's a mental toughness program. You know what I mean? And so mental toughness is something I still have to work on to this day, even though like people be like, what? Like, yeah, like I'm – far more mentally tough than the average person, but I'm a long way away from where I want to be and where I need to be. And I know that. And so for me, it was personal development. Um, like I said, I, I equate, even though I've never been to jail or prison, like being a fighter for 10 years like that and eat, sleeping and breathing that life. It's kind of like equivalent to like being in prison for 10 years and then you get out and then it's like, you're in the real world, you know, but it's like kind of weird in a different way because it's like, at one point in my, it, it's even like almost worse than that in a sense, because like I went through a really bad depression when I retired from fighting. Like people, like very few people could ever relate to like what I went through, like physically and emotionally <clears throat> to transition from fighting to the real world. So you have to understand, even though I wasn't like a famous UFC fighter and I didn't have a whole lot of success at one point in my life, I was like the fucking man though, 
for a little while. You know what I mean? Like I would walk into Mandalay Bay and there was 30 or 40 people there like trying to take a picture with me, trying to get me to sign. They have like pictures of me printed out like in gloves and like all this stuff. And I'm just like, dude, I'm just Matt Van Buren from Chesapeake. You know what I mean? I just like to fight. And it's like people want wanting me to sign autographs, sign pictures, sign posters, sign gloves. Like I was getting fan mail. You know, I made I mean, it was a ton of money, but at the time, like I think bigger now, but at the time, still a lot of money. But at the time, I was like, you know, I made like one hundred five thousand dollars in like six months. You know, it's like I'm fucking rich. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and so, but like in in a sense, I, I was because I was I had money, I had no debt, but I also had time freedom too. So you have to understand, for years, I lived a life of financial freedom that most people will never experience not only did i live a life of financial freedom most people will never experience but i was doing what i truly loved you know what i'm saying like for those time in my life like if i was one of those people like what would you if you could be doing anything right now what would you be doing i'd be like bro i'm a fucking cage fighter that's what i'm here to do that's what i'm doing and so for years i lived in california like i would train in the morning i would go train martial arts in the morning get my workout in and then me and my buddies would go ride motorcycles all day. We go ride in the mountains. We go to the beach. We're here on the beach, take a nap, whatever. And then we come back and we train again at night. And we didn't have a job. We didn't have a boss. We had sixty grand in the bank and no debt. And all we have to do is work out twice a day. Just chilling. And then, oh, you're gonna fight in two months. Like, cool. You're gonna fly me to freaking wherever. You're gonna fly me to Boston. And you're gonna pay for my hotel and put me in a five-star hotel and you're gonna pay for all my meals and you're gonna give me a check for 40 grand and i get to beat this dude up in front of his family and then everybody's gonna want to buy me <laughs> beers after and all these girls are gonna want to hang out with me it's like dude you're, you're like you're pretty much a rock star you know you're right. just like a very under very 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 underpaid rock star you know and so from living that life to fucking going flat broke and having no idea what you're gonna do and having no skills is a very tough pill to swallow, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, no, I bet. I yeah, mean, we, I, was, we kind of see it like in the UFC, like perfect example, like a lot of times, like you mentioned, like some fighters, like especially if they're very successful, they don't know when to step out of the game. It's know? it's hard to walk away, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. like, like Tony <clears throat> Ferguson, prime example, you know? Like it's, I mean, cause it, when, when you've done, and that's the thing, it's like, I think it's a big part of why I have fulfillment issues in my life is because once you've done something like that and like done that, like what, what's left after that? The only thing that I can think of right now that could equate me to that. And people are just like, Oh, you have to bury that and move on. And like, and yeah, I agree you do, but it's very difficult, right? It's very difficult to do that. And once you've lived it and experienced it for years, you know, and so the only thing that I could think of that would come close to that is if I had like $10 million, you know what I mean? Like if I just made a lot of money, it was real successful. And then I had just true financial time freedom. I could do what I want when I want. And I had money. I could help people. Uh, I could, you know what I mean? Pay for my buddy to take a week off work and just come to Europe with me, and hang out, whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, and you can make differences in the community, help people with charity stuff, whatever, because you got money. That's the only thing I could think of that would maybe like give you that type of fulfillment because it's just, you know, it's, it's just very you difficult. You know what I mean? No, like, because you brought up the fulfillment part and I think that is more important than the actual dollar value. Right. Right. Cause think about it this way. A man, a man who's on an Island, stranded Island, billionaire on an Island, but doesn't have access to any of his bank accounts, no society, no technology, nothing. Is he wealthy or is he poor? At that point, on right. the island, he's poor. Right. Right? Yeah. What would make him wealthy? Maybe, well, maybe maybe a bottle of water and a can of soup. Mm -hmm. That would make him wealthy. Right? right. If he's in that situation. What would fulfill him at that moment? So, you know, I think that's a big part of it is why a lot of people sometimes they start chasing the dollar, the dollar amount rather than looking – you know, at life itself, you know, you have people who like in third world countries, like some really poor, dirt poor guy who's just smiling in his hammock on, you know, on the edge of the beach yeah. going fishing. Like 
he's the wealthiest man in the world and in his mind you know like he's living living his life he, but then you I'm got envious of people like that right honestly i'm envious of people that make like 45 grand a year and they're like Have coaching their kids softball yeah. and they're like oh, there's nothing i'd rather do i wouldn't take a job <laughs> for 200 grand selling insurance right. or doing this right. and i'm like i'm fucking jealous he's that fulfilled guy. <clears throat> I wish I could be like that sometimes, you know? Yeah. And really, because that's kind it's of like just what like, we're all after, right? Yeah. It's the fulfillment. So, <clears throat> so anyways, it's like, what do you, what do you, um, I guess, what are you up to nowadays? Like, what's, what's business like? And uh, what are you getting in? What are you currently into? What are you getting into? And what are maybe some projects that you're working on? Um, so currently, my main focus is on Medicare health insurance sales. Um, I have a couple agents that write business that, that I make overrides off of, but my main focus is, is really, I just, uh, I, I sell Medicare plans and help people with their Medicare. That's my main business. Uh, I do pretty good at it. And, um, like I was number one salesman out of 700 in the state of Texas in my agency of 1500 agents. And I'm top five. I'm always top five overall out of 1,500 agents in my agency in production. Um, and then I have a watch business too. I sell high-end watches, uh, like boutique watches, Rolex, Oldmar Piguet, Panerai, um, you know, brands like that. Okay. So. What got you into that? <clears throat> or so, how did you get into that? Yeah, so uh, when I was living in Florida, I met a guy who – was into the watch business uh, and he was very successful at it. And he was kind of, I didn't really know anything about watches at the time, except they were expensive and I couldn't afford them. And even if I could afford them, it probably wasn't a good idea, but for <clears throat> the ones that you deal with, I mean, right, they're not right, known yeah. like Timex or Casio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I like those watches too. I, yeah. I had a G-Shock for the longest, but what are you doing with like Rolexes, APs? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I, I think the most expensive watch I've sold was sixty-five thousand dollars, and on average, some of them are fifteen to thirty thousand. You know. You know what's interesting that <clears throat> I heard, and I don't know what this is, but I've heard that Rolex, like they're starting to become like the Ferrari of like the watch world, and by that I mean like. They won't let you get a watch unless you bought this car, that car, this car in the past. And then they'll put you on the waiting list if you buy this much jewelry. You know, yeah. what's going on with that? Like, are yeah. they not just manufacturing enough or is the like, what? It's, why a, is it it's like always that? been a supply and demand issue with these watches. You know, the demand far outweighs the supply, just like with certain cars, like anything that goes over MSRP, uh, it's a supply and demand issue, you know, because they're. If the Rolex store was full of Rolexes that people could walk in and buy, there wouldn't be a list. There wouldn't even be a gray market. So I'm consider what's considered a gray market dealer, right? So if you want a brand new Submariner, Rolex does not sell their watches over MSRP, right? It would cost you like $11,200 or something with tax. But that same brand new watch on the gray market, somebody will pay $14,000 for it because it's a supply and demand issue. They want it and they want it now and they don't want to wait and they don't want to maybe never even get one because they get on the list, they don't get one. And so all these watches sell, not all of them, but like certain Rolexes and certain APs and high-end sought after watches, they all sell over what the dealers will sell them for on the gray market because it's a supply and demand issue, just like cars, right? Or, or even houses, you know, like a couple of years ago, we were doing that with houses where people were getting into bidding wars, you know, because this is a, it's a supply and demand issue. There wasn't enough houses inventory on the market. And for as long as I've been in the watch business, which is about four years now, um, it's always been that way, you know, and that's just kind of how it is. They just don't produce enough of these units to satisfy the demand of the clientele. Do you see that as being a Rolex specific issue or is it pretty much everything that's high end? All the high end brands. The high yeah. End. Like you're not going to just walk into the AP store over there in Dallas and be like, I want a Royal Oak offshore. They'll just like look uh, at you. Unless you're funny. Drake though, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're like a celebrity, 
Yeah, you probably get I mean, one. But... It seems like Drake's giving out a Rolex at every UFC event. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. I, think I don't like, know. Yeah, he gives his favorite fighters uh, Rolexes. Oh, I At least from what I heard, yeah. Pay attention to that. I have no idea, but. Okay. Mighty generous to him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> like, I want a Rolex too, but. If I do get one, I'll, I'll get it from you, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, these dealers, they're. I, what I've what I've heard, I don't know if you, how much you know this to be true that, like I've heard just from reading around that you can even walk into a Rolex store and if they have a watch in the display, like you can't even buy that. Like, yeah, a lot of those are like some of them don't even they don't even have like the movement in them from what I've heard. Like it's a real watch, but they don't actually like have the movement in them. You know, I don't know how true that is, but I would imagine it's probably true if I've heard it from several people. But, yeah, they have display watches that they are either no movement in them or, or they're just not going to sell it either way because it's a display. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, they should, they it's like they're like the only store where like their salesmen literally are there to sell nothing. They have nothing to sell. <laughs> That's so weird. It's like you walk in and talk to them and they're just like, ah, oh, yeah, well, we don't have anything. I want, like, do they make commission? Like what? Like, I would think they do. You would yeah, think they have weird. to. Because if they have nothing to sell, why would you even want to go to work? <clears throat> it's weird. Huh? Well, they obviously got to be getting paid a salary. Yeah. Because they're not selling that many watches. Right. So they, they have to be on salary, you would assume. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure they get commission too when they do sell. Well. But. Yeah, I'm not a watch salesman. So it's, not, <laughs> it's not hard to sell them. So I don't know how yeah, much their commission true. really is. Because it's not a money issue. You know what I mean? Like, if they had 10 submariners right now i mean they could they could sell them all in, in 10 minutes they could literally if they got a shipment in of 20 of them right now they could make 20 phone calls and get rid of all of those and so it's not it's not like it's a money issue it's a weird thing like they give them to who they want to give them to you know it's not mm -hmm. like they're going to give them to the guy Oh, this guy's got more money, so he's ahead of you in the line. It doesn't work like that. They don't who even, they built relationships with. Yeah, it's yeah. a relationship. It's kind of a yeah. It's a kiss ass game. That's kind of that kind of <clears throat> sounds very similar to the whole situation with like the Porsche GT three RSs. Mm -hmm. like you can't get them anywhere. And if you do find them at the dealer, they're like marked up like to hell, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I you heard of that guy Manny Hoshpin? Mm-mm. He's like some billionaire dude. He's got like a whole. Anyways, you can you can see him on YouTube. But I I heard he gets pretty much like any any Porsche he wants. He can just go anywhere and like. It's awesome. You know? Yeah, like I mean you guys have relationships. Was, then you can. Guys with status like that yeah. for sure can yeah they can make stuff happen. You know. Yeah. So do you have any like pro any I guess like projects that you're working on right now that you're trying to get off off the ground or um, any like side hustles besides um, the watches. Man, you know, it's I, I've gotten spread thin over the years doing so much different stuff. <laughs> you know, we've talked about that. You've, yep. you've helped hone me in on that, actually. And so uh, I do want to start getting my social media going more, you know, making reels, doing a podcast and all that stuff. So I really want to get a podcast going by the end of the year and just being more active on social media and, and building the social media. But Right now, I'm just trying to, because I tend to drift with different stuff. I was breeding dogs for a while, and uh, I'm I'm try I'm at the tail end of getting my hands completely washed to that. And uh, so, what I've learned is me just mainly focusing on Medicare and doing the watches on the side is is the best bet for me right now. Um, and then, you know. I think the next step is focusing more on some social media and stuff other than that. But other than that, man, there's only so many hours in the day. Like I, right. I just work all the time, you know? And so it's, yeah. I mean, you know, you've, you've done Medicare, you've been in sales. It's, it's a lot of work, man. For sure. sure. Like just Medicare, even a lot of times I just like, don't even feel like fooling with the watches because it's just so much work and then dealing with customer service or dealing with an assistant or whatever and then certification then, yeah certifications education. it's continuing education <laughs> it's a mess. licenses yeah. you know and then on the other side is being a business owner then you got to worry about your taxes your write-offs fucking True. quick books and yeah. this and this it's just it's a lot man but 
this year I'm hiring a bookkeeper to do everything. I don't care. I'm yeah. just going to pay the $3,600. I'm going to have my bookkeeper do everything. It's worth freaking, it, man. Yeah, audit, you know, all that stuff because it's just – it's too stressful for me. Cool. So, like, you know what I mean. Like, where where can our listeners find you on social media these days? Uh, social media on Instagram. You can find me at MVB Luxury uh, on Instagram. Also, Matt VB seven five seven, Matt Van Buren on Facebook. You can follow me. Um, and my website is mvbluxury.phonesites.com. mvbluxury.phonesites.com. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll put that down in the description below. And, uh, I guess before we wrap this up, uh, if there's like one piece of advice that you could give to maybe some listeners out there who are trying to get into entrepreneurship, what would you say to them? You gotta, uh, it's going to require probably five times more work than you think. And so you, you need to be prepared to, to do the work and you need to be prepared to fail. And I think that's where like most things in life, people, they can't like, like, right. Like you've recruited agents. Like it's hard to get people to go from a job to a straight commission sales, right? Because they suck for a couple months and they never get over the learning curve. And then they want to run back to their $70,000 a year job. Right. I just went through that with an agent last year. And so, People can't get out of their own way. It's it's mainly fear. You know, you just have to overcome fear. And I heard something from a guy. Uh, I forget who was it. One of these successful guys. And he said, you know, a lot of people think it takes this, 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 and this to make money. The biggest thing it takes to make money is balls, which is, you know, it, I'm finding that to be true. You know what I mean? And, you know, the more you grab your balls and take risks, and put your money up, then, you know, scared money don't make money, as they say. There you go. There That's you go. it. Awesome. Well, um, thanks for coming on today. It was it was fun. Good times. And, uh, yeah, if you, if you guys got value out of this video, then don't forget to click like and subscribe, and we will see you guys later.